Alright, challenge ones and dark souls come in many shapes and forms. Mostly focused around using some awkward attack or doing particularly low amounts of damage. However, there is a very classic challenge run that is focused around doing an immense amount of damage. Enough to kill anything in a single hit. But with a little caveat. That you need to collect points in order to level up. And none other than Lemon from the channel The Backlogs asked me and several other challenge runners to participate in a Dark Souls 1 one-shot contest. Or one-hit KO or whatever. We couldn't really agree on the exact name for it. Personally, I wanted to call it the you only get one shot, do not miss your chance to blow, this opportunity comes once in a lifetime challenge. But you know, that would have made for a very crowded thumbnail. Regardless, I am ready to participate. I got my mom's spaghetti. I have the rules of the run right here on paper, which unfortunately are a little bit peculiar and unclear at times, but we'll see what happens. Well, actually, I don't even know the results yet myself, but Lemon was kind enough to send me everyone's score. It's a kind of a formality, because obviously I am the one who won the content. Uh, obviously, it doesn't really matter what anyone's score was, because participating is far more important than winning. Son of a biscuit, really? Well, what matters is that we all pledge our loyalty to Lemon, and fortunately, I made sure I came prepared. But what is less fortunate is that I didn't really make any... Uh, Preparations for the run itself. So my routing was a bit, um, something like, uh, We're not talking about this or this. We're talking about this. Yeah, something like that. First of all, the challenge starts after the asylum. So at least we can start off like usual, namely as a pyromancer. However, that very much was on purpose this time, because this run is going to be mainly focused around fire AoEs. However, Lemon did insist that I named my character Press Continue. So I couldn't use any appropriate alias, like uh, Pyro Nancy or Jill Overkill or something. So yeah, we're already starting off with a massive disadvantage. But the whole point of this run is to make sure that none of the NPCs, mini-bosses and bosses in the entire world of Lordran survive. But of course, you can only either kill them with a single attack prompt, regardless of whether it's a multi-hut or not, or through friendly fire between enemies. But as I said, the rules are a bit peculiar, because the way I did it here wasn't even necessary. Because it's also allowed to first attack an NPC without killing them in order to aggro them, and then reset their health bar by either quitting out or resting at a bonfire. And then kill them in one hit. Which in case of the crestfallen warrior would also have allowed me to get underneath the aqueduct in order to let him fall to his death. Regardless, each NPC, boss or non-responding enemy that is on the list will earn us a point which allows us to level up. In other words, one point equals one new level. Now, anything that is not on the list, like regular enemies, and a handful of non-responding ones, those can all be killed with as many hits as you like, and you can also collect as many souls as you like, but you cannot use those souls on more levels than the amount of points that you have earned so far. Now, my thinking was, if I want to do big damage, I need to have big bonk. So I would want to use the Great Club, but that requires 19 strength. Meaning I need to earn 7 points first. And sure, you could go for 6 more pacifist skills, but I chose not to do that, because for early game, a little less bunk would suffice. After all, in these games, clubs come in all shapes and sizes. You have the Big Daddy Great Club, Big Mommy Large Club, Little Brother and Sister Reinforced and uh, Not Reinforced Club, I guess. And of course, back in Demon's Souls, you had Baby Brother Toothpick. Moreover, the Reinforced Club would still be beneficial later on while moving through areas in between boss fights. But in order to make this into one-shot material, there's another item that I would need. Namely, the Hornet Ring. And farming for the Crest of Artorias would be rather tedious. So the alternative would be to go up the ladder past the Hydra. Unfortunately, this footage was recorded right after my DS3 without stamina challenge. So I guess I still hadn't regained my energy. Because I actually fell off the ladder. Yeah, that's... A thing, apparently. I guess I forgot to hydrate. Fortunately, the Hydra is set high by providing the proper hydration. Hallelujah. Regardless, after acquiring the Hornet Ring and then going down into Blighttown to already acquire the Great Club for later, but for now at least I would need Power Within, and also for the entire remainder of the playthrough, obviously. And then, after spending some poppable souls to upgrade to plus 5, I was ready to go clubbing. So, with the power of the Hornet Ring, and the power of, uh, well, within, 
Now I would be able to one-shot the Black Knight by stabbing him in the back. Yeah, I admit it's not very honorable. I mean, <laughs> we all hate the backstabbers. Uh, 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 yeah. Huh. Irony. Okay, then uh, I guess we'll just take the honorable route by going for a parry kill instead. I also got rid of Petrus and the undead merchant. Yeah, why him? And poor little Yulia, wherever she is supposed to be. Still no idea what that's even referring to. Okay, I think Havel's not really doable yet. And slowly killing him with fall damage is kind of tedious. But fortunately, the Taurus demon can be plunged to death. So we don't even have to make him plunge to his death, as in a gravity kill. However, we do need to come to grips with the gravity of the following situation. All NPCs are on the list. Even the ones that we kinda like. Yeah, this did not make me feel grossly incandescent. It only made me feel, uh, well, gross. So, next up was the other Black Knight. And although I think I would have done enough damage to plunge attack the undead boar, but I wasn't really sure, so I simply used the allure of the alluring skull. So, that way you can go tell him to go hog himself while he's picking out on the barbecue. Regardless, at this point I had 8 points, and I used 7 of those to level up to 19 strength, allowing me to wield the Great Club. Which in turn allowed me to say Nighty Knight to the Baron Knight Knight. So then I chose to go back to the Asylum, in order to get a chunk, and some easy 3 points to collect. Well, <laughs> relatively easy. But more importantly, the rusted iron ring for convenient titanite farming in Lower Blighttown. However, that of course would be meaningless without the large amber. So after freeing Grix, who I definitely did not kill yet, since he would be of vital importance later on. I mean, it would be pretty damn embarrassing if you kill him early on and then softlock yourself so that you would have to start the entire run over again. But you know, who in their right mind would make that kind of a mistake? Gluk, 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 gluk. Ah, that is some nice Baron Castle wine. It's a bit salty though, that's kind of weird. Anyway, in order to reach the large amber, I would need to plunge kill the Capra demon. And that's actually easier said than done. Not only because of the doggos, obviously, but getting into hyper mode at the right time, and then having only a short window of opportunity before power within kills me, and Capra really doesn't want to stand in the right position at the right time. But eventually I could make it to the depths. I definitely did not want to die here and go back to Firelink leaving my souls here, so I played things very carefully. So, Madam Butcher 1 goes down. That is for friends who do stop together. And Madam Butcher 2. Uh, God damn it. Okay, no, no. No. Oh my god, what the hell? Well, safe quitting is actually allowed to reset health bars. So, now at least I could. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay, so going all the way back and not fucking up this time. Well, since I'm here anyway, I might as well plunge attack the giant rat. How in the ever-living hell is a rat this freaking bouncy? I mean, perhaps the lore reason is that he's to prevent underleveled players from venturing further, making him both literally and figuratively a bouncer. Well, fuck it then, that's for later. So, now we can... Uh, oh, whoa, 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 I kind of completely forgot that there was even a thing. Well, just think of it as free, free points... Free, free point... Three, 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 uh, okay, in the time it would take me to pronounce that correctly, I could have counted up to three, three, but two plus one extra points at least. So, after a farming session with the leeches and picking up chunks in the Great Hollow, and on the way back scoring two extra points, however, I simply did not have enough chunks yet. So therefore, I went down to New Londo. However, that would require me to drain the water. And although I miraculously made it through the ghost house on the first attempt, then I got impatient waiting for a transient curse to wear off, because you cannot use power within when it's active. <laughs> I mean, remember all the way back during my straight sword hill run, where I learned about that when fighting the four kings? But I thought, come on, it's just a frail old man, I don't need to be at full power anyway. Yeah, it's not exactly my brightest move. 
Especially because uh, I could simply have quit it out to remove the effect of the ancient curse. Yeah. Well, anyway, I did collect the remaining titanite chunks I needed. And I was hoping I would get lucky and get a slap from one of the dark waves. But yeah, that was a very small chance anyway. So hopefully, a plus 14 Great Club would prove to be sufficient for Quilak. At the very least, it most certainly would be for the Channeler and the Gargles. I mean, there was definitely nothing to worry about there. However, Quilak is a very different story, because she simply has a ton of health, especially for this early in the game, and she also has complete immunity to fire. So although I did start to upgrade my Pyro Flame, that would only help me out later on. So how on earth do you drain her entire life bar with any type of melee attack? Well, before I ask myself how, I should have asked myself when. Because once Quillac has been defeated, Man Eater Mildred will no longer invade. And that caused me to lose my first point. As I remember, this is a contest. So yeah, that certainly sucks. This means that the max score is already out of reach. But how did I manage to defeat Quillac in the first place? Well, by making use of the environment. Because of the uneven ground, you can do a sort of plunge attack on her. Basically, a jump attack that results in a multi-hit. And with a lightning resin, powered in, and red tearstone ring active, while hitting a human body, you can in fact inflict sufficient damage on her. However, that's at least more or less how far a melee weapon will take you, at the very least as far as the boss fights are concerned. Unless you would want to go for the Dragon King X's special R2 attack. But given that that's a dragon weapon, I didn't feel like wasting time on farming dragon skills for that. Um, eh, keep that in mind for later. However, speaking of farming, in order to turn Chaos Storm that you get from the Fair Lady into a one-shot fire AoE, you will need an absurd amount of souls in order to upgrade your Pyromancy Flame. And again, the club would only really be practical against NPCs and certain mini-bosses. But uh, farming the Forest Hunters would take hours, so I only upgraded the Pyro Flame to plus 14. Which at least would allow me to light up the Moonlight Butterfly by turning it into the Moonlight Butterfly. But how many other bosses would be feasible without fully upgrading it first? I mean, it's not even ascended yet. Well, regardless, if I would want to do extensive farming, I definitely would require the Silver Serpent Ring anyway. Therefore, I made my way to Pinwheel, so that I could gain access to the Tomb of the Giants. Nevertheless, I still wouldn't want to subject myself to unnecessary farming. Especially because, as it would turn out, I would in fact subject myself to quite a bit of unnecessary farming later on in the playthrough. However, even after turning my Pyro Flame into an Ascended Pyro Flame, I still had not enough firepower to take out the Stray Demon or the Undead Dragon. So, yeah, I was at least pondering the idea to start farming the Drakes in the Valley of in case I would need to make use of the Dragon Torso Stone. But in that case, I would of course require the Golden Serpent Ring as well. So I went to Sans Fortress and freed Logan because he would be important later on. However, then I made a grave mistake when waiting for the boulders to clear away the wall leading to the Golden Serpent Ring, because I tried to get the Symbol of Avarice by using multiple Lloyd Talisman on the Mimic there. Unfortunately, I forgot that Mimics are in fact on the list as well. And even though I would have done enough damage to one-shot it, given that I punched it awake without resetting its life bar, it couldn't be considered an actual one-shot. <sighs> Crap delicious, and that means I lost two points already. Meaning my final score could only be 138. But only if I would not lose any more points, and that's a rather big if. However, what was also a rather big if, at least in my mind, was if my plus zero ascended pyro flame would be capable of one-shotting the Iron Golem. I certainly did not expect that it would be sufficient, but since I was here anyway, I decided to simply give it one shot, and, well, that's exactly what it was. Very surprising, but highly beneficial, because that's a lot of souls without requiring me to waste time on farming. Because I wanted to see if I could also one-shot poor little big boy Sif already. And I was both happy and sad to say that I was. At least that did imply that I was able to maximally upgrade my Pyro Flame without farming for souls. But that also allows us to acquire even more firepower, since Quilana drops a second fire AoE Pyromancy 
that's even more powerful than Chaos Storm. And she's not only on the list, she also has uh, served her purpose already. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes, excellent! <laughs> 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 Now we have the ultimate firepower. Well, actually, no, we don't. Because although you cannot increase the damage of pyromancies with higher stats, there are still two ways to boost the damage with equipment. The ring from Grex and the crown of dusk. However, the harrowing hindrance of heating up the well-hydrated Hydra is one hell of a lot of hoopla to go through. Not saying it's impossible, but the amount of RNG acquired is extremely high. So eventually I decided to just take my chances against ONS without the power of the crown. After all, if I could acquire the Lord Vessel, several new areas would open up to me. And since I was already starting to level up intelligence, given that the obvious late game magic attack would be Dark Beat, but with access to the Duke's archives, I would be able to obtain another spell and catalyst for an easy Hydra kill. Now other than the Dust Crown, I could acquire Dragon Form for extra damage, but given how tedious farming for skills was, I decided to stop farming and just try my luck in Analando. And at the very least, I did correctly deal with the Mimics this time. And I was in fact powerful enough, even without the Crown nice. of Dusk or the Dragon Form, to defeat Ornstein and Smo. But as the Hydra already demonstrated, damage output means little if you don't have enough damage input. Because we're dealing with a single attack that consists of multiple hitboxes, and the pattern is completely random. So even though it's not an issue if you die in the process, a simultaneous kill still counts, but getting hit while in the casting animation will cancel out the final pillars as well. And the issue is that Smo really loves to do his butt slam at the most inconvenient moment. So it would be best to first wait for him to do that move, since it's unlikely that he would do it twice in a row. However, power within is draining away that tiny sliver of health that you have left, so initially I tried to get hit by Smo's hammer right after killing Ornstein to give myself a little extra time since I didn't require RTSR for the first phase. However, that wasn't very consistent. So it would be smarter to do it in reverse. Start an RTSR mode and only use power within at the start of the second phase and then hope that Smo would do the butt slam quickly and or just get really lucky. Because to be clear, one shotting with these fire AoEs at least comes down to 99% luck and only 1% input from the player, if even that. That is definitely the major thing that makes a challenge like this very frustrating. So after acquiring the Lord Vessel, I decided to clear out the entirety of Analando first, so that I wouldn't have to return here later on. Well actually I did leave the giant blacksmith alive, and good thing that I did, because he is still relevant near the end. But it turned out that going into the Painted World would have been better safe for later as well. Because Priscilla was actually not on the list. She's the only boss fight who is an exception to the rules. Lemon claims that this was to prevent a potential softlock. And that makes sense, but we all know he wants us to stay away from his fluffy tail waifu. But that means that the only points in this area were from the invader, whom I have hardly ever fought before, I think. But, uh, you know, no issues there, of course. And definitely no issues from uh, weak enemies like regular hollows, obviously. However, there was another rule I literally had to ask Lemon about in Discord while I was standing underneath the dragon butt. I mean, that skip is so common that I don't even recognize it as a glitch anymore. But no, the dragon skip was not allowed. Meaning I was uh, kind of completely boned. And not the homeward variety as you are stuck in this place unless you walk the plank. So yeah, that was certainly a pleasant and highly relevant little detour at this point in the playthrough. Are we boned? Yeah, we're boned. And about just as pleasant were the lock-on issues that I had to deal with against Gwendolyn. I mean, I had more than enough damage, as Gwendolyn has very little health, so a single Chaos Fireball is already sufficient, but the goddamn freaking lock-on kept screwing me over. Holy frick, just lock on, please. It's such a small distance and I cannot lock on. So, this actually made me wonder. Could it be that if you enter this boss fight when using the Covenant Ring instead, that you can lock on from a greater distance? 
As in that the darkness of nighttime on Orlando decreases your lock-on range. I mean, it is a thing in Dark Souls 2, but I'm not quite sure whether this existed back in DS1. So this fight definitely made me wonder whether that might already have been a thing back then. Well, killing the armored boars with Chaos Fireballs was much easier than Gwendolyn, without having to deal with any lock-on issues. And the one around the corner could easily be lured with the sweet allure of an alluring skull, as these boars are known for having a giant sweet tooth. Two of them, in fact. But of course, lemon is anything but sweet, so it left a sour taste in my mouth that I was not allowed to make use of the Duke Skip. Especially because going through the archives the normal way uh, might have resulted in me suffering a death here and there. One or two. Round it down a little. A little bit. But with Logan out of his cell, I had now access to the Crystal Soul Spear and the Crystal Staff, which would finally allow me to defeat the Hydra and claim the Crown of Dusk. However, I wasn't done here yet, because I had to progress Onion Bro's questline in order to make Onion Sis appear in the Golden Crystal Golem. However, when tracking Siegmeier down down in Blighttown, I suddenly got attacked by Laurentius. I actually didn't even know that he had a questline at all. So that kind of took me completely by surprise. Now, you think that wouldn't matter because I could easily parry him to death, but uh, hold on a second. There is in fact a potential problem here. Laurentius wasn't at full health because of the poison. So given that I'm writing this before Lemon's video comes out, I'm actually not even sure whether this counts as a point or that the point was that I couldn't count it as a point since it doesn't count as a point. Wh what? I guess my point is that the rules were a bit unclear. I mean, it's environmental damage, but he's also not at full health. Regardless, whether or not it counts as a point, Laurentius was already down for the count, before I could even point this out to Lemon. So I guess I'll have to wait and see if it counted as a point, but I wouldn't count on it. And uh, yeah, very sad indeed, but what's even more sad is that right after helping out Onion Bro, I would have to turn little Onion Sis extra crispy. That was a big nothing. <laughs> hey, who left this bowl of onions here? Well, at least now I don't have to use fire tempest on the Hydra. I mean, you don't fish with fire after all. You use a harpoon or a fishing rod. And although dangling your rod in front of seven hats sounds quite appealing, given that it has to be a quickie, just shoot your shot and get it over with. In fact, not only is Crystal Soul Spear the better solution here, but it also applies to the next Golem Golem, because you absolutely do not want to use a fire AoE, given that this Golem Golem contains Dusk. And it's true that she's on our hit list as well, but if you kill her before speaking to her, you will not be able to summon her, which would lock you out of obtaining the Dusk Crown. Now fortunately, once you summon her, you are free to kill her for the first time, because yes, Dusk is worth 2 points given that there are two versions of her. However, although the first kill is easy, the second one requires an insane amount of luck to even get the opportunity to score with her a second time. And spoiler alert, that is something that would leave me absolutely seething. Which is ironic because Seath himself had the exact opposite effect. He was uh, kind of uh, piss easy. I mean, he's weak to fire and he's a large slow moving target making him one of the easiest one-shots in the game. In fact, the two remaining golden golems on the way towards his boss arena gave me quite a bit more trouble. In fact, I couldn't tell whether the AI was terrible or so smart that they could consciously troll me. Regardless, I decided that it was time for the DLC, which might sound a bit too early, but Crystal Soul Spear is not really one-shot material for fire immune bosses. After all, those are an obvious obstacle when you mainly rely on fire AoEs. In fact, Crystal Soul Spear even fell short against the Sanctuary Guardian. Heck, it even fell short against the Gaping Dragon, whom I paid a quick visit to before entering the DLC. So other than our Firestorm AoEs, what we really want is the immense power of Darkbeat, which is fortunately not after Manus, but right at the start of the Chasm of the Abyss. And that's a good thing, because unlike the absolutely abysmal experience of trying to one-shot the father off, the walker in was surprisingly easy to deal with. All you need is a little bit of hitbox prawn to uh, get a safe enough opportunity, which actually happened to be on the second attempt already. 
In fact, come to think of it, this is even a viable strategy for people who struggle against him on SL1. After all, stats don't affect the power of pyromancy after all. But what was even more surprising to me is that Kiran gave me more trouble than Artorius. And what might be surprising to you is that that's in fact the correct pronunciation. Human, why have you the ring of Artorius? I am Kiran, and that is a keepsake. Yeah, I guess the issue is that uh, she has way more health than you would expect from an NPC. But then again, she is one of the four knights, so in a way she's on the same level as Artorius and Ornstein. I guess it's a shame that she doesn't have her own boss fight. At the very least, I did experience it kind of like one in this playthrough. In fact, the same applied to the fourth and final knight of Gwyn, who apart from already being a massive boss for shooting down Kalamid, without that slightly little convenience of having, you know, eyesight, so maybe it's not surprising that he required a full powered hyper mode dark beat in order to take him down. However the same thing did not apply to Calamite, because despite being a fire breathing dragon, he is more susceptible to fire than to dark magic. Well not that dark is even a damage type in this game. Furthermore the fire that he breathes apparently isn't even fire damage to begin with. It's actually just like dark beat, a mixture of physical and magic damage. So ironically it's actually not that ironic. in. In a sense this time i guess maybe kind of lost my train of thought there but uh, the thing is that one shot in calamid with fire tempest it's not necessarily difficult but it still took quite a few attempts because just like smo's butt slam calamid likes to react by flying upwards to do the downward fire breath so you're better off first baiting that attack since he's not likely to do it twice in a row but of course even then there was still a lot of RNG involved to get the full damage out of Fire Tempest. But ultimately this was not that painful of an experience. Menace however would prove to be a massive menace to Mayanus by being a miserable mass of RNG misery. The worst of the entire playthrough. Well technically except for 4 kings but that's a whole other issue we'll get into much later on. In fact I wanted to save Manus for later as well. So given that Darkbeat is now in my possession, I decided that it was time to clean out the remainder of Lorden first. Therefore I went to make sure that Caesar's Discharge would cease discharging his lava, allowing me to have a second encounter with Kirk, who I already encountered after that quick little detour towards the Gaping Dragon. I still think that Kirk is a bit of a poor name choice, I think it should have been Dwight the Porcupine Knight. Regardless, even with Darkbeat I actually only barely laid waste to the Fire Sage. However, I could easily succeed against the centipede. But before a uh, expectedly very uneventful quote unquote fight against the Bat of Chaos, given that it would be an actual challenge to not one shot her, I first had to cross three more NPCs off the list. Yes, not merely the remaining Daughter of Chaos, and not merely the final Dwight invasion. No, it was finally time for an onion to make us teary eyed. Yes, it was inevitable that at some point I would have to kill him. And unfortunately, that time is now. And just like with Solaire, I think you are aware of the gravity of this situation. But I guess I kind of wasn't. You know what, now I'm not even sad anymore, I'm just annoyed. <laughs> what? Would you get out of here? So before going back into the DLC, I decided to do some more cleanup. After all, Nido would be easy at this point. And because I'm such an expert at this game, a master at parrying, and with the directional instincts of a homing pigeon, this uh, didn't take all that long. In fact, I also encountered a weird glitch when fighting the titanite demons in Sense Fortress, where it looked like someone photoshopped the soul counter to hide the fact that I might have lost like 300,000 souls or whatever. I mean, it's one of those oddities in From Software's game design. I mean, good thing that didn't really happen because that would suck. But uh, you know, the thing that would suck even more is uh, having to one-shot Manus. And given that now, all that remained in the lands of Lordran were Gwyn, the Four Kings, the Giant Blacksmith, the past version of Dusk that appears after Manus is defeated, and of course, Manus himself. The father of abysmal experiences. The RNG that will drain your energy. But why exactly? Well, it's a combination of factors. It isn't merely that Manus needs to give you an opportunity to cast Fire Tempest at all and that he needs to remain passive as to not interrupt your cast, 
and of course the luck involved to hit him with the entirety of the attack, which despite the many pillars consists of only three active hitboxes, or three waves of hitboxes, that as you know appear at random locations. But here is the worst thing of all. Manus has 6665 HP, but even if all three hitboxes connect, that will only inflict 6033 HP. The number that will haunt your nightmares when doing this challenge. Meaning that the only way to one shot him is if one of the pillars connects while Manus jumps away, resulting in aerial instability bonus damage. So it's not merely necessary to hit the father of the abyss with all three pillars, but it's imperative that you will also hit this dark eater midair. In fact, not only is that necessary to inflict enough damage, but it pretty much has to be the first pillar in order to push Manus immediately into a second phase, given that a magic attack has a slower windup as to not interrupt your casting. However, whether Manus jumps away, jumps away at the right time, and jumps away at the right distance, is all up to RNG, on top of the RNG of where the fire pillars happen to emerge in the first place. It takes hours upon hours upon hours of attempts, as you are essentially participating in Lordran's lottery of laborious lackadaisical lunacy. There is one more detail that you might not even be aware of, but remember that Dusk counts as two points, her present version and her past version. But the only way to kill her twice is to kill her present version first and then her past version after Manus. However, if you get a simultaneous kill against Manus, the area will reset and Dusk will be gone forever. Meaning that you can have one opportunity to obtain the point of Dusk from the past, immediately after defeating and surviving against Manus. So given that there would be no quick and easy method to this madness, I decided to actually finish the already mind numbing drag of farming drakes for dragon skills, because the dragon torso stone buff would boost your damage more than the crown of dusk would. However, it was all for naught, because the buff only lasts for a few seconds, basically only as long as the freaking casting animation itself. In fact, the slow casting animation was already an issue, since most of the time Manus would already hit the ground after jumping away, before the first pillar could even emerge in the first place. Therefore, I made the even more painful decision to continue farming, but not for skills this time, but for souls, in order to level up my dexterity all the way to the casting speed cap of 45. Which uh, can take quite a long time, given how much each level is worth at this point. So <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't really lose uh, 300,000 uh, souls before, because uh, that would have been uh, a tiny bit completely fucking infuriating. So, after going through all of that, did it actually make any difference? Um, maybe? I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Because I kept on dying and failing and getting interrupted. And it went on and on and seasons change. Oh, how much longer is this gonna take? Oh, I'm sweating like crazy. I guess I better remove the face warmer. Ah, if only there was some sort of tactic I could use. In fact, I even tried luring him to the edge of the arena first, hoping that having his back towards the edge would prevent him from jumping out of my AoE when doing the very necessary sequel to the Flame Lurker leap. But I at least did not have any success with that. Which is ironic because apparently some of my fellow participants got the same idea as well. And for them at least it did seem to hasten their success, or rather it sufficed to slightly shorten their suffering I should say. But eventually, after what felt like an eternity, success became an inevitability. Oh my god, I defeated him and I'm still alive! Meaning that I can now obtain that elusive second point from Dusk. Oh my god, I have to let the guys on Discord know about this. Dudes, I actually beat Manus and I survived. I got the best possible result. So perhaps I might actually win this contest. Uh, huh? Huh? No. No. 
Is, is she's already gone? And she's not near Elizabeth's corpse or the lack thereof? You cannot resummon her in the past? She's gone? Forever? Never to be seen again? Completely inaccessible and therefore an absolutely unobtainable point? All because I forgot to heal before Power Within could kill me? <gasps> Fuck! Oh, hold on a second. Let's rewind. No, 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 no. That's not going to be sufficient. I mean, merely jumping out of the window is not gonna convey this level of fucked upness. So, uh, hold on a second. So let me just uh, go down here. Yeah. Yeah. I think this will paradoxically make a lot more sense given the circumstances. Fuck! Okay, nailed it. Yeah, that, uh, that was certainly a shame. Ah, crap -alicious. You know, I think everyone who participated in this contest should just band together and have Backlogs do some kind of a run that will really piss him off. After all, when life gives you lemon, you should make lemon hate. However, you would think that Manus would be the king of pain, but not when there are four mores that remain. Yeah, the part of the playthrough I dreaded most. Because this is actually even worse than Manus. We're dealing with four separate targets, with a collective life bar, of almost 10,000 HP. In fact, I wasn't even sure if it would be possible at all. Not only do the pillars of Fire Tempest act rather inconsistently in the Abyss, but even if I somehow could get all four kings to spawn and remain in the exact right location, which is up to RNG, would that even be sufficient to drain away that much HP? Not to mention getting an attack opportunity and not getting interrupted during the entire casting animation, at the right time, while four separate AIs tried to target me, I really couldn't tell if it was even possible, as I couldn't find any footage of a true glitchless one-shot of this boss in this nearly 12-year-old game. And after all the suffering in the chasm of the abyss, I could no longer handle being fully submerged in it. And I decided to throw in the towel and go for a two-shot instead. So uh, basically the Walton Simons approach. I am a patient man. Ask me if I care. But not that patient. At least this way it's still technically a one king fight. But regardless, it's still one more point that I lost. Perhaps it is possible and maybe one day some handy Andy will find a way to do it. Yes, perhaps one day, maybe some weekend, it will happen. So, in a rather anticlimactic way, after failing successfully against the kings to acquire the shard of their lord, the actual lord of the kings was kinda... Well, I think you know what to expect by now. But that was it, meaning that all that remained was to one-shot myself by going for the Link the Fire ending, because who would be the dark lord would come down to who got the highest score. Yeah, it was quite a painful experience in the end. But hey, you guys don't see these videos in a chronological order this time, given that this was recorded quite a while ago. The next playthrough for me will be the Demon Souls Area of Effect challenge. So that at least shouldn't be all that hard and will allow me to relax a bit after such a grueling experience. So thank you Lemon, I, uh, I hated it. But you already know I would happily do it again because of my very unhealthy state of mind. But I guess that applies to everyone who participated. So thank you very much for including me in your contest. And for the rest of you, thank you all very much for watching.